Hallo zusammen! Today I want to talk about one of the most popular and well-known inventions from Germany. Even though most of you might not know, it was actually invented and created, developed, however, by Germans. Yes, it's true. To be honest, at least talking about first world countries, I'd say there isn't a single person under the age of, let's say, 40 to 50 maybe even, that hasn't been in contact or hasn't used an mp3 file in their lives yet. I don't think that is uh, possible. No, even toddlers, even embryos, even... They, they, they've all used mp3 files, yes. They all have. And even though I'm only 26, I vividly remember switching from this one to this one. Yeah. And I'm actually still using this, although it's like 10 or 12 years old. 8 gigabytes MP3 player from Philips. It still works. But this one did as well. This one, my portable Discman. Oh yeah. I've used you many times. That sounds intriguing. And before using mp3 files, I actually used to rip music as WAV files from the CD onto my computer. But obviously they were really, really huge files and uh, I wasn't too happy about that. Because back then I didn't really think about quality and file formats. I didn't know too much about that. But when I actually heard about mp3s, that's how we Germans like to put this. I was pretty blown away. Yeah, I really was. I mean, it all depends on the respective quality settings and quality characteristics of MP3 files, but I'm really satisfied with 192 kilobits per second to 320 kilobits per second. That's my preferred choice of quality. But still, and I was actually asking myself that back in the day as well, how did those people that came up with the mp3 file format managed to make these songs so small in terms of the file size. How does that work? The foundation of having compressed audio formats in general was also laid in Germany back in 1987. Back in the day, several scientists at the Fraunhofer Institute cooperated with the University in Nuremberg Erlangen in order to create a file format that could convey music in an almost or seemingly equal quality to the original files, while using much smaller file sizes than lossless formats could convey, so you'd be able to save quite a lot of disk space. The idea of digital audio compression was born in a time when CDs had been established and used since about 5 years. Throughout the 1980s, companies such as IBM also released the first proper personal computers, or home computers, so I think it's pretty safe to say this decade in particular was pretty fascinating and a busy one in technological regards. The long form of MP3, or MP3 as we Germans like to put it, is MPEG-1 Audio Layer 3, or MPEG-2 Audio Layer 3. The term MP3 is the so-called Dateiendung, the file extension. Developed from the early 1980s onwards, both the MPEG-1 and MPEG-2 standards were published in the early 1990s. The MPEG-1 format was the idea of compressing movies up to the point they would fit onto a normal audio CD. Of course, this also meant a comparatively huge loss in quality. MPEG-2 files became rather well known through and commonly used on DVDs. It is still being used in many different media fields nowadays. And by the way, DVDs were introduced and have been used in the mass market since the mid-90s, and the MPEG-2 standard was published in 1994. Both the video source and the audio source could be compressed, yet at a certain loss of quality. And whereas these two formats, MPEG-1 and MPEG-2, dealt with both video and audio sources, the MP3 format is only used for audio material. So coming back to my initial question, which part of the music which musical information needs to be cut off in order to get such small files. It has to do with the psychoacoustic phenomenon and the way the human ear or the human brain works. Let's find out more about that. This is what the original Fraunhofer document about the MP3 and its history has to say about the psychoacoustic phenomenon. Musik besteht aus sehr vielen verschiedenen Komponenten, die aber nicht gleich gut hörbar sind. 
So bleibt dem Zuhörer zum Beispiel ein leises Flötenspiel möglicherweise verborgen, wenn gleichzeitig kräftig in die Trompete geblasen wird. Zwar ist das Flötenspiel immer noch vorhanden, aber das menschliche Ohr kann es im Augenblick des Trompetenspiels nicht mehr wahrnehmen. Die Flöte wird durch die Trompete verdeckt bzw. maskiert. So, put in different words, an MP3 file projects the dominant trumpet even more specifically into the foreground, while the almost inaudible flute, playing at the same time, gets pushed more into the background. Encoding acoustic information by cutting off inaudible frequencies helps to save quite a lot of file size. The common human ear doesn't even know it's pretty much unable to hear certain details in the original music in the first place. And on top of that, it probably isn't aware of the fact that this psychoacoustic phenomenon is used in an even more dominant way by creating and using mp3 files or similar lossy file formats. To be honest, I don't know about you guys, but I'm always shocked when I'm like at a friend's party and they play music via mp3 files and it just sounds crappy and it's not the music itself that's crappy, it's the quality. Because they converted the music, the original file, to 128 kilobits per second and that sounds... Ugh, ugly, annoying, nasty, whatever. It doesn't sound good. And I'm constantly fascinated about why my friends aren't able to hear a difference, a significant difference between, say, 128 kilobits per second and 192 kilobits per second. Maybe it's just me, maybe it's because I'm an audiophile anyway, I like good quality in terms of audio and music and whatnot, so I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but uh... And obviously, of course, you can't regain lost quality. So you can't regain quality when you want to convert 128 to 192. That doesn't work. <laughs> Next to many others, there's one name that gets and needs to be mentioned in this context every time. Karl-Heinz Brandenburg. He's a German electrical engineer and mathematician. And you could consider him one of the main developers and, if you will, inventors of the mp3 file format. For many years the Fraunhofer Institute earned a two-digit million income for mp3 patents alone each year. However, in May of 2017 the licensing of the mp3 format by the developers ran out after the last remaining patents in the USA had also run out. And this makes the mp3 format a licensing-free standard nowadays. Truth be told though, even though the mp3 file format remains to be one of the most well-known and popular file formats for compressed digital audio, there are more efficient file formats in terms of lossless quality and still being relatively small. For instance, a pretty well-known and nowadays pretty much established more recent audio codec would be FLAC, the free lossless audio codec. A huge part of the incredible success the mp3 format has had has to do with its cultural impact at the right time, respectingly during the fitting time frame. It became more and more handy and doable to send songs to friends and family through the World Wide Web, just because the files were so small. Of course, the worldwide usage and spreading of the mp3 file also brought many problems or at least discussionable aspects along illegal downloads, etc. But first, this would be too much to talk about here and now, and second, I'm not sure if mp3 files were a main reason or just a handy tool for these actions, because the same has also happened to movies and other forms of media, as we all know. Not all musicians necessarily like the idea of listening to their music via mp3 files, one of the most anti-mp3 musicians I know is Steven Wilson and he has elaborated on iPods using mp3s and the digital download culture in various interviews. To be fair, he has sort of changed his mind regarding services like Spotify and his music being available on there, even though I think he still might not be a fan of the idea of consuming music this way. So to end this video I want to show you a snippet of a Steven Wilson Q&A event that he has held, I think, a couple of years ago. And he's actually talking about music and how he, as an artist, as a musician, thinks it should be consumed or it should be perceived, so to speak. And by the way, and I'm not getting paid for this, I just say it because I think he is a sort of a musical philosopher, if that makes sense, in many regards. 
and his music is so diverse and still really interesting all the time. This is uh, definitely one of my favorite albums. It's pretty much close to 70s progressive rock, but also with a slightly modern touch. So it was produced by Alan Parsons. It's called The Raven That Refused to Sing and other stories. Really good. Check out Stephen Wilson's music if you're into cleverly made rock music. You can't go wrong with that. Pro I promise. And of course, I also want to know your opinion. I also want to know what you think about the use of mp3 files, which quality you prefer, whether it has to do or has had to do with illegal mp3 downloads, illegal music downloads, whether mp3 files do have something to do with that actively, or if they just like a tool, an outlet for that, and a need that's there anyway, if you know what I mean. I don't know. I'm not too sure about that myself. I think it's a mixture of things personally, but who am I to know? So feel free to write a comment. I'd really appreciate that. And thanks for watching anyway. I'm your vlog Dave. Tschüss und bis zum nächsten Mal and keep listening to good music. Music ultimately is made for sharing with as many people as possible. I'm not in the business of making music to be exclusive or just for a small few. So in that sense, I'm kind of forced, if I want to share my music, which ultimately is the reason I make music, to share with as many people as possible, I'm forced to embrace whatever means there are for that music to reach as many people as possible. It doesn't mean I have to like it. That's like saying, you know, just because a painter, you know, paints a beautiful painting, he's not going to stop his painting from being, you know, on the internet as a JPEG. It's still a great, you can still appreciate it's a great painting. I think this is my point. There is, there is such a thing as quality, of experience that unfortunately because of the way the human race is we always 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 go for convenience over quality of experience and the ipod is a great and the whole download culture is a great example of how convenience has won out over quality of experience music is art it should be presented as art not as a bunch of software files that's the way i feel but i know there's a whole generation of people that have grown up with a completely different philosophy i still want them to listen to the music so, you know, but all I can do is, you know, with the movie, for example, try, it's a horrible word, but I'll use it anyway, educate people <laughs> to understand, it sounds very pompous, but you know what I'm trying to say, try to make people understand that there is um, another level of, of listening, you know, quality of experience can be much higher than the way most people now are experience, <coughs> experiencing music, which is in a kind of horribly compressed, effectively a bit like a piece of software. Um, it's almost, it's like funny now, there's this new word for music, which is content. As if the music is somehow just something to fill up a hard drive. And of course, that's the, that's the, that's the, the tail wagging the dog. The music should be the special thing, not the hardware, not the convenience. I'm not creating content for an iPod. Uh, and unfortunately, that's the way I think a lot of people look at it these days.